The following program contains archived content. Some of the information may now be out of date. Welcome everybody to my podcast, Big Little Small Talk. I'm Megan O'Hara Sullivan and I love to talk, but I also love to listen. If you're new here, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome along to our segment that we call Big Little Small Talk and it's our segment here on 4DDB where I go out and I get to talk to someone in the community. And today I've got someone interesting from the Stamp Club, from the Toowoomba Stamp Club and his name is Bob Littlehales. Welcome along, Bob. Pleasure to be here, Megan. Bob, I'm going to talk about the Toowoomba Stamp Club in a little bit but I want to talk about you and when your love of stamp collecting first started. Can you tell me about that? <laughs> That's a fair story. Uh, okay, happened to be over in England from 51 to 53. We were there for the Queen's coronation. Shortly before the coronation, another boy and myself were indulging ourselves in the habit of throwing slate from a blackboard at one another. Oh, yes, very safe. Very safe pastime. Anyway, he got me on the kneecap. And I spent the next three weeks getting tetanus shots every three hours. And if you're like me and you enjoy your sleeping, (laughs) getting a needle every three hours wasn't the thing to do. And the nurse from the airfield where we were staying had great pleasure in using my left and right buttocks as the target. And she'd come in, bang, that time again, Bob. (laughs) and uh, enjoyed herself immensely puncturing my backside. And as a young boy, that wasn't very attractive. Anyway, I survived that. But during that period, Dad, who was a pilot in the RAAF, but was over there completing his pilot office uh, training, was flying up and down the Mediterranean and landing at various airfields, including Malta, Gibraltar and all the rest. And he thought, oh, I'll give that little bugger of mine something to do so he bought stamps for me at every base that he pulled into and that got me hooked from then on was compounded later when we were in oxford i was digging in the solid ice bound dirt that they call gardens over in england and found a leather satchel of coins cartwheel pennies if you know what anything about cartwheel pennies they're a large extra large penny and I found this bag and thought I'll go down take it to the local stamp dealer and see what I can get for it. So he came to an arrangement with me. He supplied the full set of the Queen's uh, omnibus set for the coronation and that was all the British Commonwealth countries and I was a proud possessor of that for many years. And you were away and you you had a love of stamp collecting from Ever that. Since. From that, right. And were you looking at the stamps while you were in hospital getting the needles every three hours? Yes. You were uh, looking at them in your book? Yeah, I, I was mounting them in those days because Dad bought them in a packet and I was mounting them into an album. And what uh, did mounting them mean? What what sort of thing? Use, use a hinge. Which Were they is, those little plastic corner things? Is well, that what known? Yes. They're, no, no. The things you lick and, it... and stick on the back of the <laughs> stamp and lick again and stick into the book. You put them and into then, the book. And do you still own that coronation set? No. Uh, Where did that go? For what swap or what um, uh, trade or what? Uh, over the years, I've probably had 20 or 30. Uh, of those, of that the, set? Of that uh, omnibus series, yes. Okay. Uh, and what about the um, the Gibraltar and the Malta stamps? Do you still own those? No. No, I've, I've gone through a heap of different collections. Like most schoolboy collectors, you start off and you keep everything you can get your hands on. Because of my circumstances being in a country and going to numerous schools, I accumulated a heap of material very, very quickly. And Dad bringing back stuff from everywhere and having correspondence coming from everywhere. In those days, that's where you got your main stamps from, from off letters. From letters. Well, so... A bit foreign today. Yeah. <laughs> so could you, you could actually buy the stamps that were un, 
unstamped by the post office yep. in the sense M- and you and called. you got the mint okay yep. and then you also got them off the letters as yes. well and i would imagine the ones with the post office stamp are not worth as much are they is that correct uh in queensland because of our climatic conditions particularly what's been happening the last week or so mint stamps develop a form of mold which is called rust to stamp collectors and it very quickly wrecks the stamp so over a period of time i have eased myself out of mint stamps altogether and concentrated on getting used ones going back to my first comment about um, the various collections i've had you start off with the world then all of a sudden you work out that that's going to take up two rooms to put it in so you cut back to say british commonwealth and then that gets the same particularly in the modern era so i'm now back to australia and the australian states and are you at the moment collecting the ones that are being brought out now or you're collecting old stamps or how does it work I, or what really I, holds your interest i have given up trying to collect everything i've cut off at well i've cut off at decimal currency which is 66 but also i have cut off in reality to two main ones in the british commonwealth and that's the first stamps or first stamp set which is the ruan map or the one following that which was the george v series and i also am working very heavily on all the varieties including the Punches ones, the OS punches and the private punches and it, it what, goes what are the punches? What does that mean? Well, what? the OS punches was back in the days when uh, government departments had to use stamps to put on their mail and post out. But to protect those stamps from people that wanted to borrow them or take them, they punched them with an OS puncher. The first OS puncher was very large, too large for the stamp because very quickly it frayed and fell apart. So they reduced the size of the OS and they applied that. Right. So what does it say that OS stands for? Official service. Right. Okay. Quite quite simple really when you think about it. <laughs> That's right, as those sort of things always are. So you're in England and how long did you stay there for? Did you father- fifty three. Just for that year? And no, no, 51 and 253. Three, okay. And then you came back to Australia yeah. and settled somewhere around okay. Toowoomba? Or? No, no. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I was born in Middle Park and lived in Elwood, which is right side by side. Is that in? Victoria. Victoria, okay. It, it's near St Kilda Beach, if you know Victoria at all. Not or very Melbourne. Well. Yeah. We Moved from there out to the upper reaches of the Yarra at a place called Kangaroo Ground before we went over to England. When we came back, we went to Kangaroo Ground and I went to Kangaroo Ground State School until I graduated to the Eltham High School. Then half, well, I'd only been going one year or two, uh, and then Dad got transferred to Townsville. So off to Townsville to finish my schooling. And Uh, during all of these years of being at at, um, different schools, were you making friends with other stamp collectors or were you in stamp collecting clubs? It was quite the thing with other boys. Not not so much. I didn't join many clubs. That came later. In reality, uh, most of the schools had a little club within a club sort of thing. Um, and uh, you could join that quite easily. In Townsville, I only pursued it for a short time, and I had a big junior club at the town hall at the in the library, and then it outgrew that, so they shifted it somewhere else, and at that time I dropped out. It was a hobby that was good for those early years, but when you started your last year, couple of years of school... When the rugby boys caught up with you, you mean? And, and and the uh, football took over and the swimming and the cricket and the athletics and girls um, <laughs> and, and and all mixed in together. Um, no so time for stamps. No time for stamps. So, <laughs> so and no money left either. <laughs> that's right. So were you, um, when you were collecting stamps when you were a kid, how did you get your collections? Did you save money to get them or how? how Every you have... way you could think of. Nearly all kids of those days, their relatives used to keep stamps off the envelopes or, mm. or, or if they saw something in a shop that Tommy would like or whatever, they'd grab it. 
Mm. And the girls. Mm. Uh, the girls were just as good a collectors as the boys. Right, interesting. It was a real um, uh, uh, multi... Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, whilst I was living in Elwood, there was two girls across the road that both collected stamps. Do you there remember a, their names, Bob? Those two Kay girls? Kay and Laurel. Yeah, mm. how about that? I wonder, they're Kay and Laurel. I wonder if they're still collecting stamps or whether they're the well, presenter of no. the Elwood Stamp Club. No, no. One of, one of them had a very unfortunate life uh, and a short one. Uh, the other one, I don't know whether she's still alive, but uh, she had a very unfortunate um, romantic situation. Not very romantic situation. By uh, sounds of well, it. her fiancé went over to New Zealand and uh, got caught in a uh, snowstorm. And I think it was 17 years later they found his body. My goodness. When right. the glacier moved down. Right, right. Yeah. So not a, not a happy occurrence. No, well, that's right. Well, we'll move on to happier times. So, yeah. Bob, you're the president of the Toowoomba Stamp Club. Now, it hasn't always been the Toowoomba Stamp Club. It was, I think this is the third iteration of the Stamp Club here in Toowoomba, yes. is it? Can you tell me a little bit about when it first started and the reasons why the first and second club didn't keep going or what, what do you know about that? Okay. 1895 is the first uh, recorded message of a stamp club in Toowoomba. The research was done by our current treasurer uh, and one of our members who is very much into genealogy. So he's gifted in that area um, and he's done a lot of research. The club was very short-lived as far as we can make out because there was no records kept. Um, and uh, we have a record of the first meeting and that's it. And then there was another one that came a little bit later and it seemed to die off very quickly. And then another one, all with slightly different names, but had the same meaning. In reality, it was probably the second club in Queensland. The first would have been the Philatelic Society of Queensland, I think was the name of the original one, or the first one. And it's amazing just how long. Then we got to 1975 from memory, and that's when the Rose City Stamp Club or Philatelic Society was born. And we have basically continuous records of existence from then on. The club was changed to the Toowoomba Stamp Club in, not real sure, I think it was probably the 80s. Um, anyway, um, in probably the late 90s, we took the step of becoming an incorporated body, mainly to protect the members. Okay. Um, there was not a great deal of protection for them under the structure that existed right. previously. So you're in the business of, do you say philately? Is that how you say Phil it? Philately. Philately. <laughs> philately. Yeah. Okay. It's a bit of I've a tongue twister. I've said it twister. once. I yeah. probably won't say it again. <laughs> You've just recently had a very special occasion. You had the National One Frame Exhibition. Can you tell me about that? It was a very big job that we took on. We didn't really understand how big a job it was until we got into it. Fortunately, we had a lot of guidance from a couple of people in Brisbane who had experience in both judging and in running these type of shows. And they were brilliant. They, so what really, is it exactly? It's an event that's really set up to bring home the message of philately, the collecting habit, the displaying and everything. It focuses very heavily on displays, and we were told to expect 35. We ended up with 70-odd. 70, 70 frames. frames, right, yeah. not 70 patrons. No, oh. 70 frames. Yeah, okay. So where did they all come from? <laughs> People all over Australia. They enter them, do they? They enter in this, them, yeah. In this exhibition. Yeah. Right. So how do they hear that there's going to be an exhibition, I suppose, today it, with it, the it's, internet? It's pretty Oh, cool. it, yeah. it's promoted. Um, we were approached by the head body in Australia, Australian Philatelic Council, or Philatelic Federation, Whoa, sorry. that's get, a double tongue twister. Mm, <laughs> <laughs> um, get that one around. <laughs> anyway, we sort of set that up, uh, or we agreed to do it, and they were very helpful also, and gave us a lot of assistance. Then COVID came along, and everybody's wringing their hands, <laughs> us included, and trying to work out whether we could overcome it. And one, a couple of our members came up with the thought that, right, 
they thought they were smart enough to set up a digital system whereby we could do a virtual display. Brilliant. And they did a brilliant job. They got assistance from other quarters, but the outcome is far superior to anything that's ever been held before. Okay. So were you telling me too that this was the first for regional Queensland? That yes. This national... Yeah. Um, Never been done National one-frame exhibition. Yeah. So one-frame is the terminology for the display of it, is that's it? That's right. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's a wooden frame. In the modern sense, it's divided into four rows of four pages. So, in other words, 16 pages makes up a frame. Okay. So you've got to fill your subject, whatever your subject that you've chosen, into that 16 pages. Okay. And, Bob, can you still see the virtual exhibition online now? Yes, how it's do you, available. How would I go about that if I okay, had a special love go. for coronation stamps or something Whatever. Else. <laughs> there's, there's a huge range. As I said, there's 70 different things. Right. And the range is thematic through to traditional, which is, okay, what do I collect? Or then you can go into things such as aerophilately or, and all this sort of What's the different. kind of wackiest thing? You know, there's not like um, modern um, the you know, thematic synth players or something like that. Th- no. Thematic can be very interesting. Right. Uh, because I have seen a display on bonsai stamps or stamps showing bonsai plants. Right. Now, there's not many, or there wasn't very many in the world. And then because of this interest, all of a sudden <laughs> they're coming out so of the woodwork. who would be putting the stamps? Who puts the stamps out? Is it... The, Everybody. The, uh, every country in the world. It, so it's it's a government thing, isn't it, obviously? But in most cases, it is a government thing, but they call for tenders. They call for artists to put in uh, a design and they pick design to... The, the, okay, they advertise what they want to display. It might be Aboriginal art. It could be um, native animals, whatever. And, and they put that out and then they get these displays come in. Uh, or designs come in and they pick out which ones they'd like. And they'll only do a certain run, will they, of a collection? Yeah. Uh So traditionally, were stamps only ever, well, they couldn't have been, I suppose, in countries that didn't have the Commonwealth because they always used to be the royals, weren't they? Uh, No, No? they've been issued by countries all over the world. Yeah, so they whatever, yeah. Yeah, and the only countries that, Basically, well, Britain is an interesting one. They do not have the name of the country on it. It has the Queen's head. But every other country would have the name of the country, would it? Yes. Isn't that interesting? Except some of them disguise it because of their use of their language. Their language hides the fact that it comes from whatever. Barbados. No, no, oh, yeah, you say Barbados, Barbados you're going to is, tell me a story about Barbados. Bar- Barbados is very easy because it's <laughs> Barbados. Um, and it's after the, apparently in the next couple of weeks, isn't it? it ceases yesterday, to, it became a, common, uh, a, a republic, republic yesterday. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Which is most unusual because its history, it was a British possession not not just a, a british colony it was a british possession mm. uh, so it's had a circuitous route it has, to get where it's it got has. i'll just remind listeners that they're on 40 db community radio and we're in that segment called big little small talk and welcome along it's great to have our guest today is bob little hales who is the president of the toowoomba stamp club and he's taking me through some fascinating parts of Philately. Did I get it right? No, no. not quite. <laughs> <I need to. laughs> Philately. Philately. My That's problem is I've got, I've got it written down incorrectly. That's my problem. So tell me about a um, a meeting of the Toowoomba Stamp Club. What would happen at a normal meeting or an average meeting, Bob? Okay, an average meeting, we would generally have between 40 and 50 of our members there. We generally have a visiting club and also a visiting dealer. We have a local dealer, uh, I don't know whether you know, John Laker or of Laker Philatelics is the local dealer. And it could be any one of several dealers uh, th- as the visiting dealer. Equally, it could be one of several clubs. We tend to invite those clubs in because most of them are suffering from a malaise of, of modernisation where their membership numbers are dropping off because we're getting older. We're getting older. It's yeah. the same for all clubs everywhere. <laughs> every 
We're fortunate. We seem to have a, a steady number coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, How many active members would you have, Bob? Okay. We have a membership of, I think the last count was about 94. Out of those, I would count about 60, maybe 70 active. They don't come to every meeting, but they would attend more than six a year. Sorry, and now I interrupted you. So you said that at a normal meeting you might have a dealer come along and would they give a presentation or no? Uh, not, no? We used to have, but we don't have time anymore. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> so at a normal meeting we have a business part of it, which we endeavour to get that over in the shortest possible time frame. <laughs> and then people go to visit the dealers go to visit our bargain table, which is there too. Also look at the auction lots. We have an auction every meeting and it's only a small auction. And in addition to that, we uh, have a little school, which I do and I like doing because I get asked some very interesting questions that so got to make me think. So tell me more about that. What is it? What's a school? It's a school basically to pass on knowledge that, I've got and other members have got about their particular interests to people that are interested. We all collect different things, so it's good. There's a good interaction. And the school is a perfect forum for people that are a little bit uncertain of themselves to get an opportunity to ask a question, which if they got up in front of 40 or 50-odd people, they'd be too shy to ask the question. Do they ask you things like, do you still lick stamps and stuff like that? Yes. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, and and the, the common one is, how do you soak the modern stamps off paper? Well, I was going to ask that question, Bob. That was and, coming after the and, how and, do you still and, them? Okay, okay, the very easy question, you don't. Oh, so tell because me. Because they've all got die cuts in them. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean by a die cut? Oh, with the frilly edge? No, 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 no. That's, that's the perforation Oh, perforation, cut. yeah. A die cut is a, is a slit or a scalloped edge or something like that so that if you try to take the stamp off it falls apart or, or falls apart well it's it's good for australia post mm. because people can't reuse them but it's awful for stamp collectors mm-hmm. because how do you collect a used stamp mm. so tell me what do you do you cut around it you trim around it nice and neatly and put it in with the backing on it Okay, and that's the same with the earlier ones, was it? You didn't no, no, try and the take earlier them ones, no? the I soak off, or, or soak everybody off. soaks off. Okay. You have to be careful depending on what type of printing process there is. In some of the early ones, you've got to engrave your printing, which can run because of the certain types of ink. So you have to be careful and you only use lukewarm water in those, whereas you can use warmer water in the later issues. That is fascinating. And, and what about the answer to the licking? You don't want to be like George Costanza off Seinfeld where no. he um, had the cheap invitations to his wedding and then yeah. the girlfriend licked them and, and she passed away. So you, yeah. you don't lick stamps anymore? No. 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 Very few people would lick stamps. And, and I don't like it, like licking hinges much anymore. What for are the hinges? Similar, the hinges are how you stick the stamp in a book if you're going to stick them in a book. Now you use what are called... Hagner or similar sheets where you slide them into little cellophane strips and they're all mounted there and you put them in whatever order you like. I had a mental image of you going up to a door frame and licking the hinges off the door frame. No, 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 no. no. So tell me about um, (laughs) what's happening now that I would imagine people don't really write letters anymore that much. Yes, it's a big problem um, for people that collect used stamps. So there's... For modern used stamps, a lot of collectors basically go and buy the stamps, put them on an envelope, dress them to themselves and send it through to themselves. Why do they do that, Bob? So they can get that stamp cancelled by the post office and they will go into the post office and make friends with the postmaster and ask him to put a nice circular cancellation on it because otherwise the post office will whack it through uh, their machine which just puts a, a what through. So have I got this wrong then? It's actually more valuable to have the stamp on it than not have a stamp on it. At times. I think it is more genuine. To have a nice cancellation on a stamp, in, in my view, is far more realistic than buying something that's mint. 
It's just a sticky bit of paper. Yeah. How <laughs> interesting. That is really interesting. Now tell me about, I'm probably going to get this wrong again for the fourth time, I've got written down a philatic service. Now what would that be? Okay. A philatic service is what most post offices provide. They have collectors go, contact them, either, okay, email, um, electronically, uh, in, on the internet, go into the post office, send a mail, a letter in, or, or whatever method they want to do, and order certain stamps from a list that gets printed out. The Australia Post puts out a bulletin of saying these issues are going to come out at such and such a date. Put your orders in and we'll make sure you get them. Okay, right. Yeah. Uh, and most post offices around the world do exactly the same. Okay. And is that number of those that they're producing diminishing now, is it, because of the... No. Life? In fact, it's increasing out of all proportion to the number of collectors that are around. I would estimate that there's a huge amount of wastage because the junior collectors aren't there anymore. So do you know what I mean when I talk about a yearbook, an Australia Post yearbook? No. Okay. I'm thinking high school yearbook. That's the, all yeah. I got, Bob. Okay. They put put out a book, which is a beautiful book. It, it really is a, a work of art. And they put every issue that was issued during the year or one of every issue that was issued during the year. I won't elaborate on that because that will get you more and more confused. <laughs> uh, and then they sell you that uh, in January after each year is finished. So in other words... This January, you'll be able to buy the 2021 one. And you've got a book that's got all these stamps in it. The trouble is, because the market is flooded, the value of that, unless there's something special in there, is diminished very, very quickly. Okay. When you buy a stamp in any sort of collection, if you get it straight away, is it just the cost that a normal stamp would be? Yes. They don't. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But they get... As they get more rare, I guess, you pay more money for them than yeah. the original cost of them. That doesn't happen with a lot of stamps. You've got to go right back to find any stamps that have appreciated greatly because the sheer volume of the modern stamps, uh, okay, would, would have started probably oh, going back to the 40s when all of a sudden mail usage increased enormously. And collectors increased enormously because the war's over. So what are we going to do? What are the kids going to do? Oh, we'll give them a hobby, collect stamps. No TV, no mobile phones. Well, there's still a phone, but you've got to wind it <laughs> and you've got to get in the queue. <laughs> uh, so they've got to have something to do. And so a lot of them took up stamp collecting. Yeah. And the Boy Scouts and the Girl Guides had a collector's badge and what was the easiest thing for them to collect stamps so it wasn't just rope tying it was stamp collecting as well yeah that's right Isn't that interesting? can i ask you another question do you wear glasses or did you wear glasses when you were before you had your cataracts done uh yes i did and do you think that was from did you wear glasses for distance was that all that stamp collecting and looking at those little tiny stamps i wonder uh i needed glasses well before the stamp collecting oh, came. Well, I'm just running, <laughs> running my other theory past you there. I'll just remind the listeners that they're on 102.7 FM on Community Radio and we've got the pleasure of talking to Bob Little-Hales, who's the president of the Toowoomba Stamp Club. Now, Bob, we've covered a lot of territory. I want you to tell me about your annual stamp day that you have in October. Okay. What happens then? It is a combination of basically the activities that we strive to do and incorporating all the other nearby clubs and attract members of the public. We have been very successful over the years in attracting quite large numbers of people to come along and have a look at our stamp day. It's an opportunity for some of them to offload their stamp collections to dealers or to donate them to such organisations is the hospice, which we support. Some of the items that we have in our monthly auctions are for the hospice. And 
so you make money for the hospice, is yeah, that Yeah, we, we sell all those items for the hospice. Okay, well, we've had the pleasure of having Graham Barron on yeah. <laughs> Big Little Small Talk, so <laughs> yeah, it's a circular it's yeah. a circular argument or a circular um, economy that we've got going it, here. It is. It, it, it really is. And Toowoomba is basically a, a, a perfect place for this sort of scenario because in reality we incorporate, I'm talking we, the Toowoomba area, incorporate right out to western Queensland, far northern Queensland and southern Queensland and across the border into northern New South Wales. There's a lot of stamp collectors. Are you getting very many young members now? Not saying anything about your age, of course. Thank you. And you and I both be very grey. Th- 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 <laughs> thank you, Megan. That was very pleasant. <laughs> very polite. Uh, the main thing that we're finding is the young people will come along with their parents when it doesn't interfere with their other activities, namely sporting, namely school. Uh, Sporting is the big one that we're finding is a big competitive, which I can't blame. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, look, get out and enjoy yourself in the sunshine or the rain, whatever, because... You're going to need that exercise that in later yeah, life. Yeah, for so, sure, to be fit and healthy, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can come and join a stamp club in your later life. <laughs> That's um, if they're taking after you, Bob. Bob, I was having a look through some of your life members on your website and I noticed that there's a lot of men and women with the same names who I am presuming are husband and wife. So you said before that it was a it's a good hobby for men and women. So you've got a lot of husband and wife life members. There's a quite a lot of husband and wife life members, um, mainly because one or both of them were interested in the hobby, or one got involved particularly in, in an executive position, uh, and the partner. Had to come in the support role. Got dragged in, you think? (laughs) Got dragged in. Uh, And end up finding that it was a good social activity as well. Because they are a good social mob. Uh, And and that's probably what a lot of people don't sort of look upon a stamp club as being. But we have quite a good social gathering. Mm -hmm. So if I'm out there and I'm thinking, yeah, I think that sounds like something that I'd like to do, where would I find you? When do you meet? What time do you meet? Where? Okay. We meet at the Annard Street uh, Toowoomba Indoor Bowls Hall on the second Saturday of every month. Preface that, we're not meeting in December because they're scraping down the floor and resurfacing it and the smell will be atrocious. Mm -hmm. I don't think many of our members could handle it. So we won't be meeting this December. But every other month we will be. On a Saturday? On a Saturday at 12 o'clock. At Saturday at 12 o'clock. At, and we run generally until four half past. Okay, so you can just come along and new members, I would imagine, are very welcome. New members are welcome, but you're visitors... Friendly, you're friendly? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when we're not out to fight with anyone. <laughs> oh, that's good news. That's great. <laughs> Bob, can you tell me about the shape of stamps? Are all stamps a rectangle? No. Tell me about that. Okay, there's a country called Tonga in the Pacific who has produced some of the most interesting shapes you can imagine for stamps, including banana shape, pawpaw shape, coconut shape, and uh, they've come out with a star shape, an arch shape. Uh, uh, it, it just goes on and on. They've come out with some very, very attractive stamps. Right. So they're renowned for their unusual shaped stamps, Tonga. Yes, they, they were. Uh the biggest failing with a lot of those stamps is they have to be very firm construction because they're going to fall apart very quickly. Um, and it's very hard to get them to stay on an envelope um, without somebody trying to peel them off uh, and damage them. So they end up giving it away. It's just too hard. Uh, and not enough money in it. Right. Isn't that interesting? I'll, I'll tell you a quick story now. My mother was a school teacher at Budrum and they used to have this heritage fair, fair in January for Australia Day and she thought, I don't know why this got into her mind, but she wanted to ask the King of Tonga to come to the Australia Day celebration. He, he would have been perfect. 
So what she did, she addressed an envelope, put a stamp on it, this is a true story, and wrote the King of Tonga, Tonga, and put it in the mailbox. We don't know whether the King of Tonga ever got the uh, invitation because we didn't turn up at the Budrum Australia Day Festival. But, you know, you never know. You yeah, never know. Sometimes those, uh, those post office people are pretty, uh, yeah. show an, a lot of initiative, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's remarkable how some of the letters, one of the classic stories that I've seen to illustrate that point you just brought up was wartime. Now, a lot of uh, men were out in various uh, air camps that had no name, no designation. The only people that knew they were was the military. Uh, and basically that was it. So they'd post their letters off home <laughs> and send it to home, wherever home may have been. Home would try to write back to them and in the end, all they could put was camp number so-and-so. They didn't even know what state it was in. And very quickly, the Australia Post, or in those days, um, the post office, worked out that, right, we'll fix this, we'll give it to the military and they can send it mm. back, which they did. And they got there most of the and time. They, and they got there yeah. all the time. Just another funny story that you were saying that reminded me one time someone sent a letter to one of my sisters but didn't know the street name and didn't know the house name but drew a picture of the streets in Budrum and posted it from overseas somewhere and it found her. So that's initiative as well, isn't it? Yeah. I suppose in a small town people know. Yeah. Well, you think about it. When the Have you ever seen the early postcards? You know what I mean, a postcard? Yes, yeah. That was posted in, say, Collins Street, Melbourne, and was sent to St Kilda and would be addressed to Mary Smith uh, at St Kilda. That's it. No street, <laughs> no, no nothing, right, yeah. and would get there that afternoon. Oh, wow. I've always thought, so our stamp at the moment is a dollar ten, isn't it, I yeah. think, unless it's changed. And I, <laughs> I don't, since don't, I've, don't think it is. <laughs> since I've sent a letter, I can't even remember the last time I sent a letter. But um, that it's it's a really cheap thing for a letter to go from one side of the country to the other, exactly. and all of that handling and all of that. You know, that to me is an incredible service for one dollar ten. Yeah. Yeah. To get well, something. you think about it when it used to be a halfpenny. Yes, I suppose it was all relative to the cost of living. <laughs> now, Bob, time's got away on us and I'll have to get on to my very meaningful questions, which um, I, I haven't given you any pre-warning about what you're going to get, but the listeners know that I like to ask a bit of a curly question. But before I do, I want to ask you one other question. And is there a stamp that you covet that you've never been able to get that you would just love to get your hands on? I'm sorry, there isn't one. There isn't. You've got everything that you want? I've got everything that I want. That's a happy man, folks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've been extremely lucky. Um, some that have been able to buy um, and some have turned up out, out of basically nothing. And, and so You've always been able to I've, get them. I've always been able to get isn't them. Isn't that brilliant? All right. So, Bob. If you were a circus animal or a character out of the circus, which one would you be, do you think? I'd love to be the lion tamer or, or the horse ha handler, the, the trainer. Right. Why the why the, um, the lion tamer, do you think? I, I would just like working with animals, whichever way. Have you got a lot of animal stamp collections? Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. I, You're a non-sentimental type of character in ca collecting, are you? You don't hang I, on to I them. I can't. You, you haven't got enough room. Uh, for example, I think I've probably got somewhere about a million to two million stamps. Whoa. So <laughs> I don't have time to go through them all and basically I'm trying to reduce it to an area that I can encompass is manageable that all fit in one room or in one, in, 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 in one cupboard it'd be nice <laughs> that's right all right so we talked before about stamps and royals so i always like to ask my listener because i'm a closet royal lover it's my secret pleasure <laughs> um which is your favorite royal bob 
You spent added, some time added, in added, England. Out of the British royals? Oh, you can have any royal, actually. That's very quite exotic. No one's ever answered with a foreign royal. Okay. Form. I think uh, with the British royals, the Queen has to be definitely... How she can cope with everything that's happened to her over her years is phenomenal. Um, and then... Um, I think uh, Prince Rainier in Mona Mo Mo Monaco. Monaco. Is um is he those. still alive, Prince Rainier? I don't think so. But he was married to Grace Kelly. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. and his son is Albert. Yeah, and Stephanie. Yeah, and I can't remember the uh, Caroline was Caroline, the other girl's name. Yeah. Stephanie was the wild one. Mm. She was always on the women's weekly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All women <day. laughs> Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Well, that's 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 wonderful. Okay. So I always like to ask people too, because there's a radio station after all, and we do play music every now and again when there's not people prattling on. What's a song that can't keep you off the dance floor, Bob? Uh, there's not very many nowadays. You love uh, every song to keep you on the dance floor. I, I don't get on the dance floor <laughs> anymore. Um, <laughs> but the song that really gets me... Uh, emotional because I'm very Australian uh, is the Qantas song. So the Qantas song is "I Still Call Australia Home." Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and that really is to me is sim uh, symbolises Australia and the freedoms and yeah, the, uh, yeah everything the, else. The, um, excellent. Okay, mm. what about a song that you know all the words to? Nah. No. Nothing? No. Are you a singing man? Or no, no. You're not a singing they man. They won't let me sing. <laughs> what about when you're noodling away with the stamps there on your no, own listening no, to no, the radio? No, they throw things at me if I did that. <laughs> I'm sure they wouldn't. No. <laughs> Everyone can sing in their own um, in their own shower or in their own <laughs> lifetime. What do they say that? So, Bob, you are a – or the Stamp Club is a sponsor of 40DB. So what does community radio mean to you? In my interpretation, I've grown up with radio. Uh, basically, it's been part of my life all along. Uh, and I've lived in Western Queensland, Western New South Wales and Western Victoria, uh, where the only means of communication and contact was the radio. Um, my brother was a, a radio nut. Um, a ham radio, uh, pretty good, made his own crystal sets. That shows me age, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and uh, he was very gifted in that department. And he used to spend nearly all his nights when he was supposed to be studying, talking away on his ham radio. And you've always, always and loved radio. Al always loved radio. Right. Um, we... I'm one, I'm I'm one of four brothers or three now, um, and basically we used to listen to the radio. Mm. Uh, there wasn't anything else, exactly. uh, particularly in a cold, uh, wet winter's night in uh, Victoria. Um, it which used to get pretty bitter. Yes, <laughs> and it took you to to another place, didn't it? You could um, and yeah. sometimes the radio stations they'd come in and they'd go out, and you'd be yeah. on one, and you could pick it up for a little That's while. Right. And, yeah, yeah. And so, similar effect when uh, uh, TV first came in, uh, when you had in Melbourne tonight. I don't know whether you ever watched that. Uh, no. No, we lived in a place where we didn't have a TV. We lived yeah. in Tara, and my mother would hire a TV over our school holidays. And mm. I remember seeing Doctor Who, which scared the pants off me. But <laughs> <laughs> that was in the early seventies. Um, so yeah, it wasn't until sort of in the late seventies that we yeah. even had a TV. Yeah, um, yeah well, we were pretty fortunate. Um, Dad was able to get it set pretty early in the piece. Um, in fact, just in time for the Olympics in Melbourne. Um, despite the fact that we went to it three days out of the 12, I think it was then. Oh, my goodness. Um, and, you would have been a rarity. Uh, it, was, it was phenomenal. I'm sure there would have been good Olympic stamps too. There was. There was a heap put out for that series um, and a lot of what's called souvenirs um, covers and, and little um, stickers, uh, Cinderella's, whatever right. you want to call right. them. 
Let me guess, you didn't keep those either, hey? I've got them all. Oh, you have got them. <laughs> oh, you kept those. Finally, we find something that he kept. I, I've got first aid covers. That, <laughs> I've got boxes of them. <laughs> Everything. Well, Bob, look, we've run out of time, but it's just been such a joy to have you in and hear all about the Thanks, world of mate. stamp collecting. I Honestly, I didn't know anything beforehand, but I've, at 12 o'clock on the first Saturday... A second Saturday, second Saturday of, of the every, month. Every month. Okay, at the Annan Street Indoor Bowls. Yep. Not December, but January. We'll February, be, March, yep. April. <laughs> all of them. We'll be there and we can come along and have a look at yeah. the stamps. Any, anybody's welcome to come. Okay, look, thank you so much for making time to talk to us today on Big Little Small Talk. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks very thank much, you, Bob. That's it for this week. Thanks for joining me on Big Little Small Talk. I hope you can make the time to join me next week. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favourite podcast app.